When I was about six years old, around 2004, my mom started taking my sister and I to Dr. Daniel's pediatric dental office. The dental center was located inside a giant yellow mansion that also doubled as Dr. Daniel's house. It was honestly gorgeous. When I first started going to the dentist, I was extremely shy and actually suffered from selective mutism and had a lot of autistic-like tendencies. Needless to say, I relied heavily on my mother's comfort and for someone to give me a voice because it was extremely anxiety-inducing for me to talk to strangers, especially men for some reason. When my sister and I got called in from the waiting room, my mom followed us to the office until she was told by Dr. Daniels that parents were not allowed to be with their children as it taught kids independence, to which my mom complied to. Once in there, he immediately separated my sister and I, and in reaction to that, I cried because I felt scared. Dr. Daniels did not like crying, so he grabbed me and put his hands over my mouth and nose, shook me, and aggressively warned me that if I continued to cry and scare the other kids, that he would make my situation a lot worse. Obviously, this just scared me even more, so I started to cry again. Dr. Daniels had enough and took me into his house, part of the dentist's office, where he screamed at me again, grabbed me by the neck, and shoved me. His hygienist, Judy, came over and told me if I continued to cry, she would spank me so hard I wouldn't know what had hit me. Afterwards, he gave me a juice concoction and left me alone in his house for about five minutes until he took me back into the dental office and did work on my teeth. I guess I just instinctively knew that if I wanted to survive, I just had to act like I was not terrified and hold on to the tears. All I wanted was my mommy. After the first appointment, my sister and I told my mom that we were scared of the dentist and that he was a mean man, but she just took it as me being an anxious child, so we continued to see him. Each visit was just as terrifying. Every time we pulled into the mansion, my heart just melted away inside my chest. I was so scared. It was no longer pretty to look at. Every time we went to the dentist, Dr. Daniels, or the Tooth Man as he called himself, always had us have heavy dental work procedures done. We had seals done on several baby teeth and plenty of teeth removed, some with his fingers with no regard to pain level at all. And often when having a tooth removal or seals done, your mouth had to be open with a retractor. He would leave us there with a the retractor on for about 45 minutes or so before he came to work on our teeth. Sometimes he would eat his lunch while we sat there with our mouth open. Probably one of the worst pains I had ever felt in my life. I remember one time when I was about in third grade, I had been leaned down in the chair waiting for the retractor on for about an hour. I was in so much pain I couldn't take it. I sat up on the chair and tried to scream and cry as loud as I could. Dr. Daniels came rushing over, angry as could be, took my retractors off and then took me back into his house, where he screamed at me for being a big baby and scaring all of the other kids. I was so sad with myself because I hadn't cried in so long. He then took me back to the dental chair and then pinned me down to my seat in a straitjacket. He put my retractors back on and said that I would have to wait longer because I caused such a scene. All I could do was shed silent tears and drool everywhere and I couldn't even wipe it because he locked up my arms. Afterwards, my mouth would become so swollen and filled with rashes, it hurt to talk for days. He would leave bruises and swells as soon as I left his chair. He would often tell my mother I was a difficult patient. If I so much as winced at his torture, once he removed six of my teeth at once and I could barely eat. While he ripped out teeth, he would often sing songs. It reminded me of almost Sweeney Todd. When I was in seventh grade, I started getting some new braces and we started seeing an orthodontist. Not long after that, we stopped seeing Dr. Dan and started seeing a new dentist who was actually nice. I had never known that getting your teeth cleaned didn't have to feel like going through a saw trap. I think my mom took us out of Dr. Dan's practice when the orthodontist looked at our dental records and saw a lot of unnecessary procedures being done on our mouths. Not long ago, I was having a conversation with a friend about our childhood fears and instantly my mind went to the tooth man. Curious... I googled him to see what had happened to him, and to my happiness, the practice was shut down. 
Also left under his name was a Yelp page that is still left up. The page was filled with numerous one-star reviews from former patients that were once abused as kids in his office, using the page as an outlet to express their trauma. I started to cry because their experiences were so close and some identical to what I went through when I was a kid. It was so sad, but at the same time really validating to know that I was not alone. A lot of the procedures we went through were just a scam for him to collect money off of our parents' insurance. And now that I think about it, he probably was so adamant on us not crying and screaming for help because he didn't want parents to hear and come and see what was going on. I shake thinking about this. I really pray that he hasn't opened up another practice somewhere else. I know it's hard not to blame parents in this situation, but the truth is, this man was a swift abuser. For every bruise and swell we had, he would have dental explanations that would make the parents feel stupid for asking. He was an authority figure. I don't blame my mom for not believing us. She knew he was firm, but probably thought we were confusing firmness with meanness. To be honest, even writing this, the torture was so wild it actually sounds made up. She eventually did come around. She's not alone as there were hundreds and hundreds of patients that were duped and deceived by him. So this happened over the span of around a year when I was 15 to 16. I'm 20 now and it only recently had been revealed to me how messed up this situation really was. I was still living at home at the time, but my sister, who is seven years older than me, had moved out and was living with her now husband, their high school best friend, and some other dude that they met via one of those find a roommate sites. He was kind of the reclusive, nerdy type, much preferring to hide in his room watching Star Trek and playing computer games than to actually hang out with the roommates and the only person he ever really seemed to want to be around was his similarly shy and nerdy girlfriend. For a little context to the story, at the time this happened, he was 28 and she was 24. They were both a little weird, but initially seemed entirely harmless. For ease of telling the story and for saving on characters, the friendly roommate will be FR, weird roommate will be WR, and his weird girlfriend will be WGF. Now, my sister and I have never really had the best relationship with our parents, and at this point, things were especially rocky. Our mother was dating a guy who was, to put it kindly, an abusive, terrible person who seemingly loathed me and would find any excuse to go off at me. As a result, I spent a lot of time staying over at my sister's place. It was around that time I'd spend a lot of time there that WR and WGF started to get really strange. As I said earlier, the pair of them were always kind of odd. They only ever seemed to want to speak to each other, and would even go so far as to ignore anyone else who spoke to them. WGF was worse than WR for this by a mile. He would at least give you monosyllabic responses most of the time. She had a kind of creepy habit of just blankly staring at you for a couple of seconds and then walking away if you asked her a question or tried to engage her in conversation at all. This isn't the really weird behavior though. When I would stay over, I'd sleep on a futon in FR's office space, which was on the ground floor. It happened to be next to the downstairs bathroom, which for some reason WGF vastly preferred to the upstairs one. She would take long showers in the middle of the night, which is whatever. I'm a pretty heavy sleeper and she wasn't a shower singer or anything like that, so I generally slept right through them. One night, however, I stayed up incredibly late doing revision and homework and happened to be awake after she finished her shower. I was too absorbed in my tasks to really pay attention to anything else, but, but I definitely noted hearing the shower shut off because that was my indicator to how late it really was. Approximately 10 minutes later, I look up from my laptop and there she is. I always kept the door open just to crack because that room tended to get unbearably hot if I didn't and she was standing there, outside the room, completely naked, watching me through the open crack in the door. I said her name and asked if she was okay. 
which seemingly startled her because she walked away pretty sharpish. I convinced myself that in my over-caffeinated, sleep-deprived state, I'd imagined the whole thing and didn't mention it to anyone. Fast forward around a month and I head over to my sister's one night to find FR kind of agitated about what he perceives to be a peeping Tom problem. He found fingerprints on the outside of his office window in such a way that would imply someone had been pressing up against the glass and looking in. The blind in this room was slightly too small for the window, so you could see in from the outside if you looked through at the sides, and the room was on the front of the house and the window was easily accessible from the street. He'd become concerned that some random passing pervert had been spying on him while he was having a private moment, so to speak, in his office or else some potential burglar had been sizing up the joint. The police were called, but as they didn't have any external CCTV at this point, no evidence could be provided and ultimately not a lot could be done. To combat this escalating further, FR installed both internal and external CCTV on the house. This was installed whilst WR and WGF were away on a holiday and I guess everyone just forgot to tell them about it. Another couple of months later I go to my sister's to find WR's room empty and inform that he has moved out. Of course I ask why and I was informed simply that he and WGF were a pair of creeps and the others had collectively decided to kick them out. Apparently her watching me through the office door was not a one-time incident. The CCTV footage showed that she regularly made a habit of standing and watching me through the cracked door, sometimes for as long as 20 to 30 minutes. I was just usually asleep when she did it. Not only that, but the fingerprints on the window had quite apparently been from WR standing outside and watching me after I'd showered and was hanging out in just a towel, which was a less regular occurrence, but apparently was caught on camera enough times for it to be concerning. As if this wasn't weird enough in and of itself, I was recently hanging out with my sister and her husband and he passed a comment about how he wishes that they'd told me the full story at the time so I could have chosen to press charges. I asked what he meant by that, and he revealed that not only had they both been secretly watching me, the CCTV also showed that they'd mess with food and stuff that I bought, including clips of him licking all of my apples, her spitting in my orange juice, even dumping regular cow's milk in my lactose-free stuff, which explained why I had a period of feeling really sick from nowhere. To top it all off, apparently when FR barged into their room to confront them about it, he not only found that several shirts I thought I'd misplaced elsewhere had been stolen by the two of them and literally hung up on their wall, she had done several drawings of me sleeping and written a poem called Ode to Me, whose contents I don't know and don't really want to know. Apparently FR gave them an ultimatum of you have two hours to get out of this house and never contact her or me again or any of us or I'm calling the police, and they took the former option. They've never tried to contact me subsequent to this, but I feel sick thinking of what they were potentially planning. This happened about a year ago. I'm 16 now. He's going to be 20 in August. We met through the internet. It turned out he lived in a city right next to my village. I was 12 then, he was 16, we quickly lost contact. After two years I texted him again because my friends edited a photo of him and dared me to send it. He'd seemed nice, we had a lot of shared interests and talking with him felt pretty natural. I was used to age differences because for some reason I never meet people my age so I didn't mind it. He took the bus to my village a couple of times and we hit it off pretty well even met my best friend. Then I heard he had a Skype call with one of my online friends specifically, that he told her how his last girlfriend supposedly ended herself because of him, because of the horrible things he said to her. My friend felt like he was beginning to crush on her, maybe because she was nice and all too kind. The other friend voiced her worry over him, turning her into his ex, 
she was understandably grossed out. My friends talked with him about it, and I asked why he had told them, but not me. He said I was too immature to understand. I was upset. I was the person who introduced him to my friend group, and he was now trying to forcefully cut me out of it. My friends had enough and cut him out instead. I didn't. I felt really bad for him. He was an orphan. He lived alone, had issues with alcohol and a lot of trouble with depression. Losing three people could have been devastating, so I kept messaging him, maybe out of pity. He turned very, very creepy, very fast. Suddenly, he called me darling. I was over the moon because I caught feelings, a little puppy crush on someone I knew I could never date, but who gave me hope that maybe, just maybe I could. He spent more time with me, sent me pictures and videos of him going on about his day, nothing too unusual. Until one time we called while I was busy playing a game on my laptop. I don't remember exactly what was said, but I remember him being very excited that 15 is the legal age in Poland. I was excited too, I don't know why. I remember being very, very stiff, even though this was just a harmless phone conversation. The joke was until February because I turned 15 then, he was supposed to visit. I felt like I owed him everything just because he had issues with his mental health. He told me that his psychiatrist said she had never met someone so young that has lived through so much, even though our conversation wasn't about depression at all. I felt so bad for him. That's why I never said anything about the things he did that creeped me out or made me feel unsafe because I was afraid he'd feel worse and do something to himself. He told me that he tried to end his own life a couple of times, so what if it was I that ended up becoming the reason he tried again? He'd already told me about his issues with loneliness and abandonment. When he visited, I learned he still had feelings for his supposed dead ex-girlfriend. He played a song that was their song. Every word in it described their relationship. While we were in my room, he was close to crying, but... I had no idea what to do. He put me in this situation even though he knew I wasn't equipped to deal with it. Once, when I was upset, I told him I don't want to be cheered up. I just didn't. I wanted to be alone, so he sent me tons of texts, pictures, and cheap cheer-up lols, things he found on his phone. It was the one time I somewhat sort of created a boundary and he broke it immediately with a Oops, sorry, too late message following. I had a school trip in October and I had a good time. From what I remember, but for some reason I just lost all of my feelings for him then and there. Maybe because for once I didn't force myself to feel bad for him and constantly check if he's online, wants to talk, or if something happened. Maybe because all my friends thought we were going to date and it was really unnerving that they didn't see anything wrong with it. I cut contact with him later, very, very slowly. I deleted him off of things he never checks, blocks his number, then blocked him on Facebook. He noticed. I never looked back. Later on, through yet another friend, the only one that kept contact with him, I learned that his ex wasn't dead. Or maybe she was. There were screenshots of him talking with a family member about the funeral, then screenshots of him talking about moving in with a girl two years older than he is, who's the love of his life, who had the same name as his ex. They sent a picture that was supposedly to prove that he was in a psych ward, but even my friend refused to believe him. I didn't even know what he was lying about in the end, or if he was even lying at all. The next school year, I'll be going to school in the city he lives in, and I know he's still out there. For context, I'm from Germany and the legal age to drink here is 16, for beer and wine, and 18 for liquor. So on the day I turned 18, me and my best friend decided to go out to our nearest city to grab some drinks at a local bar. This is quite popular, but since it was a Tuesday night on school summer break, there weren't that many people around so we just enjoyed spending time together, meanwhile sipping on some margaritas. All of a sudden the waitress who I actually kind of know because she previously graduated from a school I went to, 
comes up to us, saying two men wanted to buy us a drink, pointing at a table in the other end of the outdoor section. At this time, it was around 10 p.m., and even though it was midsummer, it started to get dark, so we didn't really see what the guys looked like at first. We just thought, yeah, screw it, why not, and went over to thank them. At this time, I recognized that they were a younger-looking guy in his early to mid-twenties, Max, and a middle-aged man that was obviously already intoxicated. The younger guy, let's call him Tom, asked us to take a seat, and since he seemed like a nice guy that wanted to chat, we agreed. So as we were talking, getting to know each other a little bit, I noticed the older guy intensely staring at me, like he didn't even blink. I looked at him as I noticed him, and it was then when he said, how old are you? You're so beautiful. Do you even know how beautiful you are? I told him I just turned 18, laughed it off, clearly being uncomfortable and thanked him for the compliment, since I knew he was clearly drunk and tried to change the subject. As we were talking about life in general, Tom tells us that the older guy is actually his neighbor, who was currently going through a divorce, and so we wanted to distract him with the night out. We thought it was sweet of him to help this guy going through a hard time. Then he mentions his neighbor is an architect, encouraging him to maybe talk about his interesting profession rather than creeping on a freshly 18-year-old because at this point he was constantly interrupting our conversations to tell me kind of inappropriate things like how sexy and special he thought I was. Then the conversation turned dark real quick. The guy started to talk about how he doesn't seem to have any sense of life anymore and that he wanted to end his own life. I also struggle with a lot of depression since I was a child, so I wasn't super freaked out. I was more like feeling sad for the guy and tried to calm him a little bit, while texting my best friend that was just seated next to me on how we can maybe get out of that situation. But then, he said, I can't. I just want to end it. I have a knife on me right now, I'm going to do it right now. Threatening his life, kind of begging us to tell him a reason not to end his own life right in front of us. Tom at this point just started to apologize to calm him down. Didn't really work. I mean, I felt sad for the guy, but we had just met him maybe one and a half hours ago, and you never know what an intoxicated man that claims he has nothing to lose that also carries a knife on him is capable of. Me and my best friend, being scared now, come up with a plan over text to fake a call from some male friend of ours that we wanted to meet up. So she changed his name in her phone quickly to a guy's name, and I called her. While hiding my phone in my pocket of my vest, and let me tell you, this chick performed the most realistic phone call I had ever witnessed. So good, actually, that for a moment I was like, wait... Is she really calling me, or did she find a friend to call? At that point, the man is just begging us not to go, making us even more uncomfortable. But we just apologized ourselves, and as we were about to leave, Tom asked me for my number. I wanted to leave quickly, so I gave him my number, which he called immediately to make sure it was legit, of course, but blocked him right after he texted me. If you ever read this, Tom, I'm sorry. You really seem like a sweet dude, but this night was just not it, Chief. Me and my best friends still kind of joke about it till this day, how quickly from zero to a hundred it went that night and how we were definitely not prepared for this. Nothing happened to us that night, but it was frightening nonetheless. Stay safe, ladies and gentlemen, because even though nothing happened to us in particular, you never know what people are capable of. This is a story with a happy ending, I promise. It's a recount of some unsettling events I went through during my college years, as well as the most amazing example of the bro sixth sense I have ever witnessed. So without further ado, meet Kevin. Kevin was a colleague of mine and was in the same group as me, which meant we had maybe five to six subjects per year together. Kevin was odd. Not that there was something wrong with him physically, he was adorable, a bit nerdy, a bit on the shorter, scrawny side with blonde hair, big blue eyes, and like 
three fluffy hairs on his chin instead of facial hair. If I had to compare him to something, I'd say he looked like a cute, soft baby chicken, if baby chickens were mentally inclined to grow into serial killers. More on that later. At first, I didn't really notice him. There was a lot of people in my class. Everything was new, and I personally did not know anyone, except for a guy named Harper, whom I knew from my sports days, as we often competed against each other, exchanged colorful insults on the track, and then go get drinks together. Harper will be important later on. So, as I've said, I only knew Harper there, and there was only six other girls in my class, as I've attended classes that held little interest among the female college population. During that time, I made friends and got really chummy with three more geeky guys. Zachary, whom I even casually dated for a short time. Steve, we realized our mothers went to college together too, instant friendship. And Rick, with whom I shared many interests. So to count it down, important guys so far, Harper, Zachary, Steve, and Rick. These are important. These would later become my personal army. And then there was Kevin. Cute Kevin, whom I made the mistake of asking if he had any notes picked up from the first half of a lecture I missed because I overslept. And Kevin speak. Hey, got the notes from this morning? Apparently translated into, I have interest in you, oh magnificent Kevin. Nothing would make me happier than knowing I have caught your eye, so please... Make sure I am never left without your presence again, for I cannot bear it. I borrowed his notes, partially copied them, and returned his notebook back. What I didn't see was that Kevin then sniffed the notebook when I had my back turned. Zachary noticed it first, and Snort laughed about it later because my first reaction to it when he told me was to sniff myself and see if I stank or something. I was young and naive then, so the sniffing was less what's wrong with him and more what's wrong with me, and that's where it all went downhill. All the next few weeks, Kevin would always be there, never talking to anyone precisely, just kind of staring at me when we were in class, when we had breaks and went for coffee to the shop outside. And then he started showing up for classes we did not attend together and said he simply arrived too early for his later classes. He never participated just sat there in the back. Also, Kevin had a sort of aura about him. Like you didn't have to look at the door to know when he entered the room. You just felt his eyes on the back of your head and kind of wished for a shower. I didn't worry too much until one day I went to the woman's bathroom during a break. I did my business, went to the front section to wash my hands. In came Kevin. I was alone. Kevin turned, closed the door behind him, and locked it. Needless to say, I was confused and unsure of what to do, so I just stared at him and asked him if he needed something. Hi, he said, and then proceeded with, How are you? Like he hasn't just locked himself in the women's bathroom with me for no fathomable reason. I realized something was very, very wrong, and attempted not to panic, managing to keep a nonchalant expression and turn towards the mirror so I could still see him and pretend to fix my makeup. It's fine, I said and spoke no more. I could see Kevin's fidgeting, playing with the key nervously, and after a long and uncomfortable silence, an eternity really, I heard loud banging from the other side of the door. It was Harper and Steve, Harper yelling something like, Kevin! Get your scrawny butt out here and open the door. I swear to God, in the next ten seconds, the door ain't gonna be the only thing I'm breaking. I could hear Steve behind him sounding a bit panicked, telling him to move since he managed to get the spare key. Kevin paled and stepped away, the key he had falling somewhere to the floor. Steve and Harper unlocked the door and Harper jumped on Kevin like a primate and knocked him to the floor while Steve and Rick, who was there as well, got inside and all but dragged me out of the bathroom area. None of them wanted to tell me what or why or how any of that happened, but I pushed at the weakest link, Rick, when we were alone and found out that a whole hour prior to all of that, Rick overheard Kevin asking one of the on-campus students, the guys who got some extra cash if they help with paperwork, fixing and cleaning the campus, for the lady's bathroom key and 
paying him for it. Rick didn't know why Kevin would need that key, but knew that Kevin was a weirdo, so he figured it couldn't be good. Later on, Steve was looking for me and asked Rick if he had seen me and stuff kind of clicked for Rick. They asked around and people told them they saw me go to the bathroom area and I didn't come out yet. More confirmed, they saw Kevin going there too and joked that there must have been a makeout session going on inside. Steve immediately connected the dots. Harper overheard him talking to Rick and they went to break me free from Kevin's affections while Steve ran to get the extra key from the janitor. Kevin appeared with a light black eye in class two days later and just wishing to forget the whole thing. I pretended he didn't even exist. I wish this was the end of it. Be a week or two went by, I figured he'd learned his lesson, he's leaving me alone. But then he got the wind in his sails back for some reason and proceeded with attempting to sit next to me in class. He was so insistent that Zachary got involved and now the guys, Harper, Zach, Steve, and Rick, made a timetable. So two and two would attend classes at all times when I was there, so each could sit on either side of me. I never asked any of this of them, they just insisted. After a few failed attempts, Kevin gave up and settled for sitting in the back, glaring at my back and the two guys on duty that day. I wish this was the end of it. Two weeks of that later, Kevin either didn't show up for class or left early. I hoped he found some other interests and that it was finally over. Not quite. I noticed Kevin was now following me to the bus station. It took just one time to see him standing inconspicuously behind the newspaper stand to freak out and call Steve as he lived nearby. Steve picked me up and drove me home. The next morning, Harper called me around 9am and went, Are you in my class at 10am today? Yeah. Well, pack your stuff and wait for me at the end of your street. Kevin is waiting for you at the bus. Steve just called me. This went on for some five days as the guys extend their bro services to now accompanying me literally at all times before, during, and after class. Just to point out yet again, I am eternally grateful for it. These four dude bros of mine were like the four horsemen of the apocalypse. All business and vengeance, and it was amazing and have probably saved me from a lot more problems with cute Kevin. That day, Kevin showed up to class looking somewhat roughed up, but now stared at me with so much hate I could barely cope, and finally, after some advice from Harper and Rick, decided to bring this stuff to college authorities. The pro dean immediately transferred Kevin to a completely different group, so our classes never overlapped again. I stopped seeing Kevin all the time and reached my final year in college, by now, Zachary and Steve moved away. Harper finished it early and no longer attended classes, so it was only me and Rick now, but it was okay, since Kevin was no longer there. I wish this was the end of it. Rick and I finished college, graduated, and decided to celebrate by visiting a medieval fair in Rick's hometown that summer. We agreed to get some drinks for old time's sake. All was well. We had a great time as we toured the fair a bit, and suddenly, Rick, the sweet, polite Rick, goes, No way. If that ain't Kevin. It was Kevin. Cute Kevin is there staring at us, then turns on his heels and leaves. We saw him a few more times. I started to panic, thinking he's following me again, so Rick was already dialing a few of his friends to come over. But Kevin suddenly got lost, and I never, ever saw him again. Carry on, Kevin. You creepy little chicken. Hope you learn to function in society by now. So this happened to me on Thursday, April 25th, and I still can't shake off how terrifying and strange it was. I was home alone getting ready for my 12 o'clock college class that morning, and I opened my blinds to let some natural light in. I glanced out my window to see a man in his mid-thirties wearing a baseball cap roaming around my property with his hands on his hips, walking with a lot of confidence. Our yard is kind of like a cliff and it looks over our five acres of property down below. I live in the Pacific Northwest so it's pretty scenic. 
I was really confused and thought maybe it was a worker that my mom had hired for renovations on the house, admiring the view. I'm a little bit uncomfortable at this point because the dude walks to the side of my house out of sight. I head upstairs to see him now roaming around my front yard in my driveway, looking at things, checking out my house. He still hasn't seen me at this point. I call my dad and asked him if we had hired anyone to come by the house and he says not that he knows of and tells me he's going to call my mom and ask her and then call me back. I'm waiting for the call when I notice this strange dude's car. It's a white Honda with no license plates, just parked parallel to the front door. The dude still hasn't seen me and he's still wandering around so I take this as an opportunity to remember that we have a security system and I armed it so if he did try to break in, it would immediately alert the police. If this was some sort of professional or worker, he would have rang my doorbell or knocked at least once. He did neither. Just then, I get a call back from my dad saying neither him or mom hired anyone to come by today and that I need to call our local police station immediately. I went back downstairs after making sure to lock every door and window upstairs and calling my city's police station. I explain to a woman on the other end what is happening and she decides that she's not going to send an officer out and instead gives me a number to call their emergency dispatch line and told me to talk to them. I call the number she gave me and immediately I get an automated message saying, thank you for calling my town's name, not emergency hotline. Nobody is available to take your call right now. If this is an emergency, please hang up and dial 911. At this point, I'm really irritated because 15 minutes has passed and this weird dude is just lurking around my house while I'm home alone and apparently that wasn't enough to warrant an emergency to the lady I called at my local police department. I hung up and decided to call 911. After getting in touch with the 911 operator, I was asked a series of questions about his appearance before they could even alert officers near me to start heading toward my house. The whole thing seemed really weird. Nobody was in a hurry to have officers come up to my place when I was a younger girl home alone with a strange dude. I asked the lady if I could stay on the line with her when she finally, after what seemed like forever, alerted police to come to where I was. She agreed and I went back upstairs to check on the weird guy, and he's now sitting in his unplated Honda either listening to a radio show extremely loudly or on a phone with someone through his car. It was a very prominent loud male voice coming from his car. Then all of a sudden I hear the tone you hear when someone hangs up on you and the operator was no longer on the line. I was really confused when my thoughts were interrupted by an unrecognized phone number calling me. I assumed it was the operator calling me back, so I picked it up. Instead, I was greeted by a really creepy, heavy breathing. I'm not sure who it was, but it freaked me out. I hung up immediately and dialed back 911. I had been pretty calm up to this point, but that phone call put me in panic mode. I got on the phone with another operator who already knew my situation and address before I could even explain it to her. She said the cops were on her way. 20 minutes had passed at this point. The dude is still here in his car and the cops aren't. Keep in mind I live in a rather smaller town so there is no reason why it took the cops as long as it did to come down. Finally this dude is leaving my driveway right as the cops pull in and they stop him and ask him a few questions. A cop then comes to my door and hands me a sketchy looking flyer saying it was just a landscaper. He said he had an appointment. I was really relieved and irritated that it was just a dude my mom had hired, until I realized it wasn't. I called my mom back and said the cop said it was just a landscaper that you hired and that he had an appointment. My mom replies with, I can assure you that we never hired a landscaper. We don't even need one. This happened a few years ago and honestly is the reason I'm so much more cautious when I'm out and about nowadays, as in keys between my fingers past 6pm if I'm alone and spray deodorant in my bag if I can fit it in, as well as occasionally carrying a craft knife in my bag too. I'd had an interview in the city center and 
had met with a couple girlfriends afterwards. I was dressed quite nicely, white blouse, black cardigan, black trousers, not jeans, and some cute kitten heels. It had been raining, and so I was quite damp and black. You can fill in the blanks. Looked like the result of a wet t-shirt contest on a car wash gone wrong. My friends had to go home, so I hopped on the bus that stopped essentially right outside my house. It wasn't late. It'd be like 4 p.m. and in the summer, so it was still light out and had stopped raining by now. I sat at the back of the bus where you usually have nine seats, four facing backwards, five facing forwards, so the heat from the engine of the old bus could warm me up a little. This guy, Frank, was already sat there, but he was tucked away in a corner, and I had headphones in, so assumed he wouldn't talk to me or was harmless. I was incorrect. As soon as the bus took off, Frank shuffled over next to me and said something. I took an earphone out and asked him what he said, and he basically just said, Hey, what, how's it going? What have you, what have you done today, missy? I replied politely and started putting my headphones back in, but he started talking again. This time he introduced himself and reached out to shake my hand. I gave him a fake name. Thank you, parents, for teaching me about quick thinking and hammering it into my skull, and shook his hand. He wouldn't let go, for like a solid minute, and was staring at my cleavage before I even said my name. I pulled my hand away, and he put his on my thigh. This is where I should have got the bus driver involved, or at least moved seats. Guess what? I did neither of those things. We talked for about five plus more minutes. I think the physical touch sort of sent me into minor shock, to be honest. I just froze. He started asking me personal questions, after asking how the interview went, such as who I live with, would anyone be home when I got home, etc. I lied and told him my stupid girlfriend would be waiting for me as she cooked dinner for me. I was hella single, but he didn't need to know that. As all creepy old men on buses do, he started asking about our relationship. How long we had been together? Would we get married? Did we want kids? Would we need a donor? Your usual nonsense, really. While he was asking all this stuff, a young guy, Sam, who was maybe my age at the time, had gotten on the bus, made eye contact with me and sort of half smiled, then went back to the top deck. So after Frank asked the somehow line-crossing question of, Will your girlfriend be waiting for you in the shower? I stood up and told him I'd recognized a friend, go upstairs, and practically ran up the stairs to the top deck where I explained everything to Sam. He let me sit by him in case Frank came upstairs after me. The question was line crossing for me, I think, because of the way he stared at me when he said it. I was vividly remembering him licking his lips and clearing his throat and everything. It was vile. I got home about five minutes after going upstairs. Frank was thankfully no longer on the bus. When I got into the house, nobody was home. My parents and sister were all out elsewhere, and I tried calling them all, but nobody answered. So I cried and shook and threw up, alone, for almost two hours. I was a shaky mess even when they got home and had nightmares for weeks and saw him everywhere I went, although when I checked, he definitely wasn't there. Never saw him again and wrote in a report to the bus company, I think, telling them the day and rough time I was on the bus, where I sat, and roughly what he looked and I looked like. I honestly got the creeps just writing about this, even though I've wrote about it briefly in an ass Reddit comment in the past. This happened when I was around 10. I live in a relatively small country and it only took a couple of hours drive to get from my house to my aunt's in another county. This story starts off with me and my mom driving home from my aunt's. We were driving on a country road when this battered looking minivan started driving in front of us at a roundabout. We were the only two cars on the road. There were gardening tools and a tarp in the back window. It was clearly the driver was either drunk or a complete idiot. They were repeatedly swerving out of their lane like they were in a video game, like a protagonist of some sort. 
It was a hot day, so both of our cars had the windows down so we could hear what sounded like a sermon blasting from their radio. We drove behind them for roughly seven minutes with my mom muttering about the state of the country. The minivan abruptly stopped in the middle of the road which roughly angered my mom. The driver did an illegal U-turn, during which two things happened. I saw the driver's face. He was a skinny middle-aged man with dirty yellow hair and a beard, and we both got a look at each other's license plates. The driver turned into the opposite lane and drove past us, heading back into town, still driving erratically and almost hitting us. After he was gone, my mom pulled over and called the police to report him, giving them his license plate and a description of his appearance. The cop thanked us and promised to get right on it. When we were nearly home, my mom got a call from the guards where they were told that they had arrested the guy who had warrants for drug dealing and domestic abuse. My mom was thanked and we all joked about her being a hero over pizza that night. Cut to a few weeks later when school had started up again. I had gone with my dad to the hardware store. While my dad was at checkout, I was looking out at the parking lot when I saw the battered minivan driving out of the lot. I didn't see the driver, so I convinced myself it was only a coincidence, although my dad noticed I seemed uneasy for the rest of the night. A few days later, my mom came home early from work, looking like she had just ran a marathon. She gave me and my brothers tight hugs, and we were sent to bed earlier than usual that night. I didn't learn about this next part until last year. The reason my mom was acting so weird is because her secretary had reported seeing a strange man inspecting the license plates of my mom's car. My mom asked what the man looked like and froze when she was given the description of the guy we had reported. That weekend, my mom didn't want any of us kids leaving the house, but I was a stubborn little broad and all but demanded to be allowed out for a quick walk around the neighborhood. While I was out and roughly 15 minutes walk away from my house, a vehicle drove past me. It was the minivan and the same man was in the driver's seat giving me a friendly nod. As soon as he was out of sight, I ran back home and told my parents who immediately bundled all of us into my dad's car and drove to stay the night at grandma's. I was put in the guest room but had zero chance of falling asleep so I was wide awake for all the drama that happened that night. My parents called the cops and informed them about the man stalking us. A couple of hours later, a squad car pulled up outside and the officers told my parents everything. When they arrived to our house, they had discovered the front door had been forced open. Some of our nicest possessions had been smashed and were left in shards on the floor. And that's not the worst part. The worst part was where the police found the man. In the pantry, holding what a female officer described as the biggest knife she had ever seen. My family has a cabin in a tiny 150 resident hamlet in British Columbia, and it's been a long running tradition for everyone to stay in it all summer every year. Because we're there all the time, we generally know all of the locals, minus the few people who rent other cabins from the owners. One particular year when I was freshly 18, I was out there with all of my favorite cousins. Since I was older, I normally took on the role of looking out for all of the younger ones, especially the girls. After a late breakfast, we headed down to the beach which was unusually crowded since the hamlet was currently celebrating its town days so there were hundreds of people from neighboring towns flocking into party. At the time, most of my family went fishing, so I was there with just three of the girls. Brooke was second oldest to me being 12, then Emma 11, and Rhea 8. We sunbathed for a bit and made sandcastles and finally headed into the water to cool off. I'm kind of a wimp, so I took my sweet time getting into the water after them. I was about up to my butt when a guy walked up and started talking to me. He introduced himself as Shane and said he loved my tattoos and wanted to say something while we were on the beach, but couldn't build the courage up until now. I thanked him and we made small talk, and I found out he was only a couple of years older than me and his family also had a cabin in town that they visit every summer. Strange, 
I spent the last 18 years of my life spending all two and a half months of summer here, and I definitely didn't recognize him. I brushed it off, and maybe I'd seen him, and he just hit a crazy face-altering growth spurt that some of my own cousins had gone through. We continued talking, and, and I couldn't help but notice that I got a really off vibe from him. Eventually, my cousins waited over to see what was going on, and he introduced himself. All five of us ended up spending a couple of hours just hanging out in the dock, chatting or playing dock wars where everyone would fight to push each other off. I knew my grandparents would be starting dinner soon, so we said our goodbyes and I walked back to the cabin with the three girls. Later that evening, I was sitting on the deck with the other adults and Rhea and Emma. We heard a quad rolling down the front street, extremely common as quads are the main source of transportation in the area, and Emma perked up saying, Hey, it's Shane. I glanced up and noticed he slowed his yellow quad to a crawl when he passed the front gate, then sped off again. I asked if she sure it was him, and she insisted it was. I immediately felt the iffy feeling I had about him intensify because we never told or showed him which cabin was ours, so that meant that there were two explanations, both equally unsettling. One... He would have had to have followed us back from the beach, which I know was entirely out of his way home since he told me where his cabin was. And two, he could have been cruising around trying to spot me and spot which one we were in. Regardless, mission accomplished, he now knew. The next day, the same three cousins wanted to hike to the rope swing, which was three miles down the Trans-Canada Trail that ran directly behind the cabin. I of course volunteered to take them, it sounded fun. We exited into the trail through the backyard and just as we were reaching the old trestle bridge, now just a rickety old footbridge, we see a yellow quad coming towards us. We moved out of the way and he stops in front of us and I see it's Shane again. The typical hey how you doings happened and before I could stop her, Rhea tells him we're going to the rope swing. I didn't want him to tag along after he went out of his way to find our cabin last night. Thankfully, he said he was heading into the bigger town just now, so we parted ways quickly. Twenty minutes later, we're nearing the halfway mark of our journey. For probably the thirtieth time that day, we heard a quad coming up behind to pass us, so we move over. As soon as he passes, I see it's Shane on his yellow quad. Awesome. Guess he decided to join us after all. I'm not confrontational, so I smile and wave to be polite, and he responds by intentionally spinning his tires to spray us with loose gravel and dirt and then speeds off. What an idiot. My bad feeling about him shot way up, so we turned around and decided to just go to the beach instead. At this point, Brooke told me she didn't like him and he gave her the creeps, while Rhea and Emma chimed in with, Yeah, he's weird. I'm glad they already knew to listen to their instincts as well. The next few days were uneventful. We only saw Shane in passing on his quad, but I no longer waved at him after he pulled his little gravel stunt. The three girls would always alert me and each other if they saw him, which I was thankful for, because he started acting a little hostile when he passed us. He would slow down and crawl past us close enough to almost run over my feet, then speed off while giving us, or just me, the finger. Keep in mind I was never rude to him. Everything seemed cool when we hung out the one time, and I kept my nicest face on despite being uneasy about his presence, yet he seemingly had some vendetta against me. Maybe I accidentally let on that I didn't want him to join us at the rope swing. I'll never know. About a week later, I was sitting on the deck reading when... A group of the kids wanted to go to the general store for candy. I opted out this time. My book was getting really good, so so my uncle took all seven of them to get the snacks and I jokingly said to watch out for yellow quads. Fifteen minutes later, I hear kids yelling with the distinct voice of my uncle and they run up to the driveway saying, Shade trying to run us over. What? I asked what had happened. And my uncle tells me that while they were leaving the general store, he had spotted the familiar kids and apparently made a beeline for all of them, speeding up. My uncle stood between the quad and the group and Shane had turned away the last second, missing them by inches. 
Immediately, all of the adults were in a rage, asking who this guy was and why he had done that. The four of us gave the lowdown on him and they told us to avoid him. Obviously, we discussed reporting it since it was bordering on violence, but we decided not to for a couple of reasons. One, other than his first name, I had absolutely zero information on him. Two, in a small hamlet one hour away from the nearest town with emergency services, cops were very, very few and far between. My grandpa said it was unlikely that they'd even consider it worth their time, so we dropped it. The rest of the trip was great. No one saw Shane again for the remaining days. I thought the weirdness was over, but unfortunately I was wrong. Because of circumstances out of my control, I wasn't able to go back to the cabin next year. The following September, we had a big family dinner, which was the first time I got to see some of my cousins in a year. Partway through the night, Emma and Brooke run up to me and say they saw Shane a lot again that summer. My stomach dropped, and I asked them if he kept up to his usual antics. Unfortunately, he had. Since I wasn't there, I guess he switched his main focus to Brooke. Thankfully, they were smart girls, so they kept avoiding him, even going on missions, as they called it, communicating by walkie-talkies to make sure he wasn't around whenever they went anywhere. It honestly made me sad to hear that these kids had their fun, carefree summer tainted by having to watch out for some idiot on a yellow quad every day. I couldn't believe he was still bothering them. They said they had a couple of more close calls of him speeding towards them, but he never got more than a foot away before turning back around. I asked their parents if it was true, and they were as uneasy as me, saying he would prowl back and forth in front of the cabin in the evenings, to the point where they had to yell him to buzz off. I've been back for the summer getaways off and on since then, but I haven't had any more encounters with Shane. I haven't even seen the familiar yellow quad, which makes me think that he hasn't been back at all. Brooke, Emma, and Rhea continue to make little jokes here and there, like, don't let Shane get you when people leave the cabin. But otherwise, the whole ordeal has been mostly forgotten. As much as I hate the fact that those innocent little girls got caught up in it, I also know it was a great lesson to them to trust your intuition about people and be wary of strangers, especially the ones that follow you home and try to run you over. As teens, my friends and I went to lots of shows, I'd say most of the people I still know today are people I met at some hardcore show at some dirty venue. Being a 110 pound girl at the edge of a pit with too many beers in her, I sometimes got bumped into, but it didn't bother me too much. So one night, this absolute beast of a man comes and stands in front of me and fends off all of the drunk punks and makes sure that no one bumps into me or my best friend Joyce. How sweet of him. So the months turn into years, and we all grow up a bit and start going to less and less shows. I was at my tattoo artist when I bump into Bryson in the waiting section. We catch up a bit. I find out that he works close to where I live. We have a massive chat. He asks about Joyce. He asks if we're still inseparable and if she still works at the same place. He's super sincere and kind, and he's well known in our scenes, so... When he asked for my number, I didn't have an issue giving it to him. After that, we're texting often, but not often enough to make it a thing. Every time I die was on tour in my country a few weeks later, and it was during the rainy season of the year. Joyce and I obviously had the time of our lives. Bryson was there, and we had shots with him. If I'm going to tell you how I lost one of my shoes in the mud, I'd be lying, because I honestly have no idea how it happened. I just woke up minus one sneaker and didn't think too much of it. They were old anyways. This is where things started getting weird. I'm at my part-time job when one of the guys from the van store rocks up to my shop. He has two pairs of vans in my size and says for me to pick one. I try to explain to him that I don't have any money for shoes right now, but thanks. He then says, Hey, don't worry. The guy with the tattoos paid for them already. You can have either one of these pairs. The guy with the tattoos? That could, that could be anyone, I thought. 
The only tattooed guy I could think of that would buy me new sneakers is probably my ex, but he lives in a different country now, so it's virtually impossible. I ask the van's employee if he has a name for me, but he says no. So I pick a pair and decide I'll try and figure out who got them for me when I'm on my break. Just as I'm about to finish work, Bryson meets me at my shop. The guy with the tattoos? I ask him, and he says it was him that bought the shoes. I say thanks and offer to repay him, but he says he would just like to take me for dinner. I politely decline, so he offers to give me a ride home. Weeks and months pass, a random text from Bryson here and there, nothing much. I got a boyfriend, we broke up a year later, I moved out of town and back again. By now, I'm an adulting woman. I run into Bryson at his show and we have a massive catch-up. He seems happy, he's doing well in life. He asks if I still have the same number. He asks about Joyce and if we're still inseparable. I say yes to everything. At this stage, I'm working at a shop in a strip mall. As per what I guess became a little tradition, a package from Vans arrives at my shop. They're addressed to me, my size, not really my style. I message Bryson and he says it's a gift and he'd still like that dinner. Again, I offer to repay him and kindly decline the dinner date. A week or so passes and he arrives at my shop with two bags full of lush goodies and lunch for myself and my colleague. He says he's been in the area and he felt like doing something nice for me. I felt overwhelmed and said that there's no way I can accept this. He insists. He says how the sales lady at Lush said that she wishes she had a guy buy her so much nice stuff. I offer to repay him still, just dinner. I say to him that I don't want to do that because I feel like I'd be wasting his time and leading him on. He says that he would never think that I was messing with him because he loves me. Loves me? Uh, okay? That escalated fast. I was without words. When he left, I sent him a text asking him to never buy me gifts again. He didn't reply. Fast forward about a month, I'm having a housewarming Halloween party at my apartment. I'm dressed as Mia Wallace and Joyce as Beetlejuice, and we're busy getting ready. I already have a dozen friends downstairs having fun and being social. Suddenly, another friend of mine hammers on my bedroom door, freaked out. There's a guy with a gun downstairs asking for you. What? A guy with a gun? One of my guests? As I'm trying to figure out what's going on, my housemate bolts upstairs, pushes me into my room, and closes me inside. Bryson is here, dude. He has a gun. Joyce is hyperventilating. I, I gave him your address. He said you invited him to your party, but you never sent him the link to your place. I'm sorry, I didn't know. Oh my god. I'm freaking out and screaming at my friends to just call the police. Eventually, my friend managed to talk him into putting his gun away, saying that if he doesn't, we'll call the police, and he doesn't want Bryson to get into trouble. I watch my friend lead Bryson outside back to his car. My last memory of Bryson is him crying loudly, pacing up and down in front of my apartment block, repeatedly hitting himself on the head with his gun. I blocked him from any way of possibly contacting me, and I haven't bumped into him since. I'm not sure if he's in town anymore. Apparently he found a job about three hours from here. I ended up moving somewhere else, but I still work at the same place. I hope he's figured out that you can't buy someone's affection, nor scare it into them. Hey friends, thanks for listening. Be sure to subscribe and click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. If you got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit, r let's read official, and give and receive feedback from the community, and maybe even hear your story featured on the next video. And join my Discord to interact with me and other listeners directly. And if you want to support me even more, grab early access to all future narrations for just $1 a month on Patreon, and maybe even pick up some Let's Read merchandise on Spreadshirt. All links in the bio. Thanks so much, friends. And remember... Number six, my dad just found my poop sock. Needless to say, he beat me with the poop sock. <laughs>